We have seen many influential figures throughout generations of Texas history like Sam Houston, Juan Seguin, Jose Antonio Navarro, and a whole array of other people that have had their fair share of influencing the state we know today. But I feel that Texas history has forgotten about a man that I believe had a big part to play in influencing the culture of our state and the way we remember the Texas Revolution. A man who created two of the most influential banners of the revolution. A man who was a proud supporter of Texas independence and whose life ended in tragedy. Today, I give you the story of Philip Dimmitt. Philip Dimmitt was born around 1801 in Jefferson County, Kentucky on an unknown day, month, and time to two unknown parents. And well, most of his early childhood is practically unknown and has been lost to history. But what we do know about Dimmitt is that he originally came to Texas at 22 years old in 1823 with a letter of introduction to Stephen F. Austin and would settle in San Antonio de Bear, specifically in La Valita, the heart of San Antonio and lived there for several years, working as a commissionary contractor to the Mexican garrison stationed there. He would later settle near Guadalupe, Victoria, after receiving a three-ledged head right in the De Leon colony from marrying Maria Luis Lazo, who was a relative to the wealthy Mexican empresario Martin De Leon. He made their home on a ranch near Victoria and supported his family by operating three trading posts, one in Victoria, one in Goliad, and the third and largest, which included a wharf and a warehouse, was located at Dimmitt's Landing on the Vaca Bay and received, according to his contemporary Henry Stuart Foote, a large fortune by honest and judicious merchandise operations, and he became popular among many Mexican citizens. In 1835, he purchased land from an original member of the Power and Howitzen colony. However, a revolution was beginning to boil within Texas, and Dimmitt was only going to be drawn towards it. As tension began to flare up in Texas over the Anhuac disturbances, Santa Ana would send his stepbrother, General Martin Perfecto de Cos, with orders to retain order within the territory. He would arrive at Campano Bay on September 20th and would move his force of 500 Mexican soldiers to Goliad to assume command of the fort Presidio La Bahia. Now, with General Cosa's movements into Texas and towards Goliad, Dimmitt saw an opportunity to take a nice jab at the Mexican government and at Santa Ana as well. So he began to devise a plan with James Fanion and John Lynn to kidnap General Cos and buy vital time for Texas to organize for a defense for the province, as well as deal a blow to the Centralists and give a morale boost to the Federalists in mainland Mexico. But even with the massive benefits of such a plan, even if it worked, the possibility of failure was still a possibility, and Stephen F. Austin prohibited Dimmitt from letting such a plan happen, though Texas would see action soon enough, when the first battle of the Texas Revolution took place on October 2nd, 1835, the same day Kos arrived in Goliad. But Dimmitt's plan wouldn't be tossed aside for far too long. On October 6th, a man by the name of George M. Collinsworth would assemble a volunteer force in Montegorda, Texas, and begin to march towards Goliad with the objective to capture the town. They would arrive in Guadalupe, Victoria after three days of marching where Dimmitt would join their expedition along with some 30 Mexican rancheros such as Palacido Benavides, Salvestre de Leon, and Jose M. J. Garbajal. Now, Collinsworth was not a stranger to Dimmitt's plan to kidnap Cos and had decided to implement his plan to kidnap and hold him for ransom or capture his war chest that was rumored to contain a total of $50,000. However, with the force still in Victoria, Dimmitt would receive word from one of his contacts in Goliad that General Cos had left the small town and marched his force to garrison San Antonio de Bayar, along with their hopes of taking Cos's treasure and holding him for ransom. 
But Cos had left Presidio La Bahia with a skeleton garrison that numbered at 50 Mexican soldiers under the command of Colonel Francisco Sandoval, and the two forces were evenly matched, with Collinsworth's force numbering at 49 men. And besides, they came this far, why stop now? They would continue to march towards Goliath and take the fort after a small fight with the Mexican garrison. After Presidio La Bahia's capture, Dimit would be appointed the commander of the newly formed Goliad garrison on October 14, 1835, and with the town's capture, it gave the Texan army needed provisions, with Dimit supplying the army as well from his own warehouses. Throughout his command, he was well informed about activities in northern Mexico through various members of the de Leon family. However, as time passed, Dimit would receive reconnaissance reports that as many as 500 and Mexican cavalry were gathering in the vicinity to advance and recapture Goliad, and this would shift Dimit's attention to Fort Lipatitlan near the small town of San Patricio, Texas. Now, as his plan to capture General Cos back in early October, he felt strongly about this plan as well, and that it would benefit the Texan cause. He not only wanted to do this to protect his position at Goliad, he also wanted this so the Texan army could have a position in southern Texas, where they could threaten Montemoros on the Gulf, as well as any relief force that was headed for San Antonio that was under siege at the time. So, to start it all off, the garrison would send two young Irishmen from Refugio, John Williams and John O'Toole, with dispatches asking the San Patricio Town Council and principal men of the town to declare themselves for the rebel cause, though their little adventure would take an untimely turn. Historian Hodart Hewson would write of their unfortunate fates, saying, these two Irish lads who dropped into the hornet's nest of Fort Lipatitlan were captured, fettered, and required to work on the fortifications, and soon after were sent to Mexico in chains. Soon after, Dimmit would send a force of 35 men under Adjutant Ira Westover, who would capture the fort in early November of 1835. With their significant victory in freeing the citizens of San Patricio, this would give them the ability to elect delegates to the consultation and organize a militia. This would also be beneficial to Dimit's garrison as well, being supplied with additional cannons and provisions, as well as eliminating the threat to Campano Bay and cutting the Mexican line between Montemoros and San Antonio. After the campaign to capture Fort Leopatitlan, and as the revolution continued, there was an ever-present divide between two factions of Texas revolutionaries. Some wanted to remain in union with Mexico, while others wanted complete independence from it. But how does Dimit fall into this category? Well, as most Texan revolutionaries were in the early days of the rebellion, Dimit was a supporter of the Constitution of 1824, and he professed his support not only to the Constitution, but to the Mexican Federalists in mainland Mexico by creating one of the most influential flags of the Texas Revolution, the Constitution of 1824 flag, or the Alamo flag, as it is known today. I have had a flag made, he wrote to Stephen F. Austin on October 27th, 1835, the colors and their arrangements the same as the old one, with the words and figures, Constitution of 1824, displayed on the white in the center, and by November 1835, the Texas Provision government had ordered that all ships in the Texas Navy fly this flag. However, as time passed, Dimmitt began to drift away from his loyalties to the Constitution and began to favor independence. His newfound opinion would be displayed when Westover's force encountered Governor Augustine Viesca, the deposed governor of Coahuila y Tejas, who had escaped imprisonment from Santa Ana's centralist regime. He would be taken to Goliad by Westover, and Dimmitt would give him refuge in his fort. However, despite being courteous and hospitable to the governor, Dimmitt was not afraid to hide his his opinion. He refused to recognize Viesca's authority as governor of the Mexican state, and this would anger many on Dimmitt's board of advisors, along with James Grant and Franklin W. Johnson. As a response, letters would be sent to Stephen F. Austin to take Dimmitt's command into consideration. Being alerted of the situation at Goliad, Austin feared that Dimmitt's acts would alienate the Federalists of northern Mexico and decided to relinquish Dimmitt of his command without a hearing on November 18, 1835. But this decision would be met with some backlash, as many of Dimit's troops who had elected him in the first place had sent a petition to Austin demanding that the order be revoked. 
The general counsel would later jump into the argument as well, as they didn't recognize Vieska's authority either. They refused to remove Dimit and instead recognized his commandancy. However, he wouldn't stay for long. On December 6, 1835, he would take a contingent of soldiers and participate in the storming of San Antonio, where he may have taken the famed Constitution of 1824 flag, or in late January, when he hurried reinforcements to James C. Neal's garrison at the Alamo. Yet, as he marched his men back to Goliad, he began to take in the idea of Texas independence, because at this moment in time, it seemed like their only hope. When Dimon arrived back in Goliad on December 14th, 1835, he began to design another flag, and the reason for this was obvious. After the capture of San Antonio, it became clear to the Texans that they would see a drastic decrease in support from Federalists in central Mexico, and to top this all off, many Tejano revolutionaries that supported Federalism were beginning to switch sides to Santa Ana's centralist agenda. Dimmitt was unsettled by the fact and believed that there was no hope for the liberal cause and that independence was their only hope. As word began to spread of another Mexican attack, Dimmitt decided to do something drastic. On December 20th, 1836, Dimmitt, along with 92 members of this garrison, mixed between Americans, Tejanos, English, Scottish, French, Irish, and others would declare Texas free and independent from Mexico on a document known as the Goliad Declaration of Independence. To celebrate the signing of the document, the men would raise several flags, among them Dimmitt's flag that depicted a bloody arm grasping a sword on a white background, signifying that they will fight till their last breath. Their actions received praise from many Texans who supported independence, which included acting governor James W. Robinson. However, as expected, they would receive criticism from supporters of the Constitution of 1824, which included Francis W. Johnson and James Grant. The two would obviously be angry at Dimmitt, and when they arrived in Goliad with a force to capture Montemoros, Mexico, things got out of hand. They were antagonistic towards Dimmit, and believing that they were the commanders of the garrison, ordered Dimmit's flag to be lowered, and to add salt to the wound, they stripped Goliad bare of all of its supplies. Dimmit at this point had had enough, and decided to resign his command of the Goliad garrison on January 10th, 1836. Dimmit would later arrive at San Antonio on January 24th, 1836, with about 30 volunteers to reinforce the Alamo, and was appointed army storekeeper. Dimmit would continue to stay in San Antonio, despite his volunteer force diminishing after the arrival of William Barrett Travis. He would perform scouting duties for Travis and James Bowie until February 23rd, when the siege of the Alamo began. At that time, he was with a man by the name of Benjamin Nobles, who were both sent out by Travis to go and scout for the Mexican army when they were cut off by their arrival. Dimmitt would later retreat to the vicinity of Victoria, where he operated a recruiting station to gather volunteers to relieve the Alamo. Yet, after hearing of the Alamo's downfall, Dimmitt would receive a letter from Sam Houston on March 12th to gather his men and to go to Gonzales. By this time, Dimmitt had recruited 21 men, and when they arrived at Gonzales, the Mexican army had already taken possession of the town, with Houston and his men retreating east. Dimmitt's men briefly skirmished with Mexican troops before returning to Victoria on March 19th, yet by the 24th, Mexican General José de Urrea would enter and capture Victoria with little resistance. While there, Dimmitt would help by evacuating the citizens of the town and would join in the runaway scrape. He would later arrive at Montegorda Island, bringing recruits to General Houston's army, who were then moving to San Jacinto. With John J. Lynn, they arrived on April 22, 1836, bringing the first supplies and reinforcements to Houston's victorious army after the Battle of San Jacinto. Texas was finally independent. The Texas Revolution was finally over, and after two years of brutal fighting, Dimmitt was ready to settle down and take a break from all of the violence. He would settle in Referio, where he would become a justice and purchase part of the Aldredi family ranch on the Oasis River. With this, Dimmitt would continue his trading franchise and would begin to build a trading post near the site of present-day Cal Allen with his partner James Gorley Jr. 
the post was about 15 miles from the post of William P. Aubrey and Henry L. Kinney, co-founder of the city of Corpus Christi. But there is something interesting about Aubrey and Kinney. They had a monopoly on the contraband traffic with the Mexican forces operating from Fort Lipatitlan on the Nueces River, and these ties with the Mexicans would bring a tragic event to Dimmitt's life. On July 4th, 1841, Dimmitt and some of his friends were captured by Mexican troops that would also confiscate merchandise valued at $6,000, and Aubrey and Kinney's post was suspiciously bypassed by the Mexican troops. Dimmitt and the other men would be sent to prison in Mon Amores, and back in Texas, people were not happy. Various mass meetings were held at Aransas City, Lamar, Refugio, and Victoria, which demanded that the Texas government obtain the prisoner's release and threatened private retaliation. Newspapers accused Kinney of treason by using his connection with Mexican General Pedro de Apudia to get the general to attack Dimmitt to eliminate trade competition. The evidence against them was foolproof, and both Aubrey and Kinney were eventually arrested and charged with treason. However, they were acquitted of their charges on August 22, 1841, possibly through the influence of President Mirbu B. Lamar, who depended on Kinney and his private force to hold the disputed Nueces region for Texas. Within weeks, Lamar had sent Kinney to Mexico to petition for Dimmitt's release, yet the request was unsuccessful. The centralist government in Mexico had issued a warrant for Dimmitt's arrest for his role in the Texas Revolution, particularly for the Goliad Declaration of Independence. Back in Mexico, Dimmitt and his friends would be joined together with 19 other Texans who were chained up and forced to march to Monterrey in August 1841 en route to prison in Mexico City. However, when the Texan party reached Saltillo, Coahuila, a massive escape was attempted where the men drugged their guards with alcohol laced with morphine. Eleven of them were later found and executed, while seven reached safety in the mountainous regions of Mexico. Yet, Dimmitt was unable to participate in the massive escape attempt. Dimmitt was separately confined and unable to escape. As time continued to pass and the search for the runaway prisoners continued, Dimmitt began to overhear that if the Mexican soldiers were unable to find the remaining prisoners, he would be shot in retaliation. Unhappy with the alternatives, Dimmitt began to sit down and think. On one hand, he faced execution if the escapees did not return, and on the other, he would face imprisonment, not knowing the day, week, month, or year he would be released. So things began to take a dark turn for the once great revolutionary. So, in 1841, at an unknown time on an unknown day, Philip Dimmitt would take his own life via morphine overdose. His last remark was, I do not fear death, but dread the idea of ending my life in a lonesome dungeon. Tell them I prefer a Roman's death to the ignominy of perpetual imprisonment, and that my last wish is for my country's welfare. The reason why I love Dimmitt's story more than others is not only the influence he had during the Texas Revolution. Him creating the Alamo flag and the Goliad flag inspired generations of Texans, and the flag can be recognized by anyone and can be seen flying anywhere in Texas. No, the reason why I love his story so much is because he inspired me. In my opinion, you can choose any one from history that inspires you, whether it be Sam Houston, George Washington, Martin Luther King, the list goes on for infinity. For me, I chose Dimmitt because I believe that the people that are almost forgotten by history have a much more interesting story, as well as a greater impact. <laughs>